There's a story inside every smoke shop, with every cigar, and with every person. Come be a part of the cigar lifestyle at Boveda. This is Box Press. Welcome to another episode of Box Press. I'm your host, Rob Gagne with Boveda, and I'm sitting next to two very important men in the industry from Castagli Cigars, Jeremy and Hello. Vlada. Thank you guys both for joining me on this episode. Great to be here. Even it's early morning, we're all ready to go, right? Exactly. We've got a cigar going, so exactly. can't go wrong. Well, what I want to talk about a little bit, and we'll get into it more later, but what are we smoking right now? Right now is something which we're actually testing, uh, getting feedback from our clients at uh, IPCPR. We're calling it the Cromelo. Cromelo. And uh, it's a new addition to our uh, Daughters of the Wind stable, as we can say. Yeah, and we're going to get uh, into the Daughter of the Wind story. Later, so, yes. That Daughter of the Wind story is very, very interesting. So we're going to get into that. But this is a Lancero, so it's not out on the market yet. It's not out on the market yet. But uh, it will be you soon. you want to tell me a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, basically, um, the, this is, I love Lanceros. You'll see, actually, I'm very Lancero heavy. It's a personal thing. Um, but this particular birth of this cigar happened last year when we put the original, the Daughters of the Wind blend together. Yep. And in there are two tobaccos which are the core of the main blend of the uh, other Daughters of the Wind. When you can't make the same blend from a, a, a 52, 56 gauge cigar with a Lancero. Right. But this was like a bit of fun. I just wanted what? to taste those two tobaccos, which was Peruvian Pinar and Dominican Caramello. I wanted to know how to interact together and to also put the uh, factory under a bit of pressure. So I said, <laughs> I want them tomorrow and I'm leaving. You make me 30 Lanceros. Good test of construction, I think. There you go. And so uh, we have just a very neutral um, binder and wrapper with that. And I just took it for a bit of fun. And people started smoking. What have you got, Jeremy? What do you come back with? Right. And everyone says, we want it, we want it, we want it. I'm not totally convinced, but mostly. And this is the first time I've done this where I'm taking direct feedback from all my uh, our guys. Wonderful. Like yourself. Voilà. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to cut this cigar with the brand new. This is the Castagli Zycar Cutter. Look at the printing on this. Nobody's printing cutters like this. This is full detail, full digital printing. Very cool addition, you guys. This is wonderful. Um, let me just... We're super proud of those. I, I love how they came out, and they did such a phenomenal job. Um, if you look at them, there's about seven or eight different colors. It's very, 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 very detailed, and it corresponds to the, uh, to the actual wallpaper from the palace that Jeremy will get into. Yes, this, uh, the pattern which you're seeing actually on those cutters, you're seeing them also on our boxes of the Daughters of the Wind now. Um, we're putting them on the humidors and our um, accessory line. Um, and this actually comes from our historic old palace in Egypt. How's that going over there? <laughs> it's got lighter problems, another occupational hazard of the business. Um, so yes, I mean, the actual Castagli story um, is very much uh, based around this Villa Castagli. Um, here we go, are we, are we going good? <laughs> and so uh, the Villa Castagli um, was a beautiful palace built by my great-great-grandfather in 1901. Stands in Cairo. Yeah, I want to talk about the Villa Castagli because the history that surrounds that entire place is unbelievable. It was referenced in many World War II memoirs during the war was also rented by the United States Department as the American Embassy from 41 Correct. to 44. Correct. And it's a central location for cocktail parties and adventures throughout that entire Cairo region. Yeah. From the original wallpaper inside the room, it's the Dum Dubar Palace in Cairo is its official name, but it's also nicknamed the Villa Castagli. Yeah, it's like we call a palace of many names. Right. Um, it was called the you know, Casa ad Dubara, Dubara being the area in Garden City, Cairo, where it was built. Our next door neighbors actually was King Farouk's uh, sister. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of history. <laughs> we had, yes, we had, it was the embassy section. Um, yep. And obviously World War II you referred to. Um, it was actually a den of, uh, we've all seen Casablanca, of course. Um, but you can imagine, imagine that Egypt as being the uh, allied one where um, uh, there was lots of uh, spying going on. It was a center of a spy uh, network to be dropped into Yugoslavia. Right. Um, and the American embassy 
Uh, my grandfather was a guest of the Germans at the time, <laughs> um, a un involuntary guest, as you can imagine. So we rented it yeah, out. He was a to, prisoner. He was a prisoner of war, yeah. captured in Crete yeah. in 1941. He has a huge story. The whole story, if you want to dive deeper, is on their website. There's multiple stories. You can Google these and get even more information on Wikipedia sites and everything like that. But really, the the wallpaper, it, it was it was somewhat rubbish because of a bunch of looters and people coming and protesting. Well, yes. But uh, you still have the wallpaper on the walls, and that was an inspiration for this whole humidor project. Yeah, that's right. Now, was... Was that kind of always your idea to take stuff from there, or was it you going there and going, "Oh my God, this is gorgeous! I need to make this into uh, into something that I can showcase." Well, well, we, we've always sort of used the sort of branding of the image of the palace, the outside and the interior on our boxes, which you can see from the Kellner Boutique Factory, which we create four of our lines from. But actually, I'm going to give the compliments to my wife. Your um, wife because, noticed uh, it was about three years ago in the Egyptian Times. Um, put online uh, some pictures of how the palace is looking today. After you cor correctly said, there was uh, property developers actually <laughs> came in in 2013 and used looting as yeah. a way of trying to burn the palace down, but it didn't work. It still stands proud today. Right. So uh, my wife was looking through and saw this wallpapering. I said, Jeremy, why the hell have you not used this um, for, your, for, your, for some of your symbolism? And of course, it adorns the room of the Byzantium room, which took, I think it was eight years to decorate. Uh, it took eight years eight to decorate Eight years to that? decorate, commissioned by my great-great-grandfather. Oh, my finished goodness. Finished in 1910. The rooms in this palace, if you go onto their website, you can see the wood. And like almost the lower half is all wood built in. It's very luxurious. Sure. Obviously, that's been removed now because of the looting. But that wallpaper sticks out and that is... It stands out, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it just I tell stands you, it was a hell, of a hell of a job from that uh, Egyptian Times uh, picture to get it vectorized and then to choose to get the colors right. Right. Because so it's very hard. You had this idea to use this pattern somewhere in something that you're going to produce. Correct. Did you know if it was going to be a humidor or a cigar or anything like that? Um, I knew it was going to be adorning the outside of our catalog, which you can see in front of you there. Um, and it looks so beautiful, people made a lot of comments. So, yes, it was kind of natural then to, uh, it was about the time that we met Nils Langdorf, actually. Yeah, so, so uh, let's talk yeah. about Nils. Nils, Nils you Mad Nils. guys met at a cigar party in 2017? Um, yeah, 2016, that's right. Roughly? Yeah, that's right. It was actually um, Cigar Kings. So cigar did Kings you have party. the idea in your head already and just out of, like, spontaneity when you were talking to Nils? Because... Nils is a master woodworker. Yeah, master cabinet maker. Yeah. Yeah, the Germans are kind of famous for a few things, but one of them is woodwork. All you need to do is um, think back to the earliest Christmas decorations. Um, we got some mad stuff, which we can probably put on a program later, um, of just uh, German mechanics and cigar things, right. uh, accessories from like 1890. Right. Um, so Nils, being an artist, is a bit of an obsessive. He saw this wallpapering. Uh, we met at this wonderful, uh, there's a friend of mine, Philippe Kruger, um, and he uh, Did had you his... pull the picture out right at the party and show Nils and be like, um, we no, should do this together? Uh, no, it was basically, we, he, he told me about his, his love of cigars. He also told me that, you know, strangely enough, he hadn't really got into a humidor project before. Really? And, As a master uh, woodworker, you well, would think he was that... making things like, he was recreating the Versailles palace floors for okay. some one customer. So he's working on high-end He was, uh, he was He's famous for, I think, there's some cabinet in uh, Mer in Florida somewhere, which was like $100,000. Sure. Um, so just, a goes, just, just, just a small change. Just a small change. The man restores castles, yeah. Don't worry right? about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so luxury items, but he never went and made a humidor. So he meets you, yeah. and now you're like, you're the perfect guy. And by the way, that's going to be the painful process. We'll talk later about product development. Right. With a master cabinet maker who wants to do all sorts of interesting stuff with it, some of it which works, some of which doesn't. And it was a really, we have a journey together. I can honestly tell you that he makes these almost at cost to himself because wow. he's so in love with the project. And then I said, well, how about meet me in uh, Inter Tobacco? Um, in, in that yep. year, and then he saw this, and he said, Jeremy. He saw the wallpaper. Yeah, and I said, I know. That's what we're So he do. saw your catalog. You guys didn't, at the party, you didn't no. say, like, hey, let's work on this no. again. So the inspiration yeah. came later from Nils to say, this sure. is absolutely beautiful, uh, exactly. beautiful pattern. 
Exactly. So that's how it all started. Yeah, and, and my wife pushing me to do it and says, we need this on accessories, we need it on... You see something in our pocket here. Oh, the pocket yeah, square. Doing stuff, and you can see. And you got it the down the uh, wava, wava Yeah, bear? and we have the we wava have the bear? birds on the on the actual shirts. And for the next run, we're gonna do them in a single tone, but they'll be raised and, and basically done a three D pattern. Wow! Uh, like it's we did last year. It's a beautiful pattern. It Came shows really elegance, nice. luxury, and tradition, and, <laughs> and like just yeah, tradition and just. Beautifulness, like Thank just you. visually like beautiful. Like Lancero cigar, right? This is smoking very well, by the yeah, way. I'm, I'm enjoying it too. Extremely so the feedback smooth. to myself is 100% at this moment. <laughs> this is wonderful. So we'll be responsible for putting this into production. At, um, what do you guys say at IPCPR? You guys are going to own it as well. Anybody that makes it here likes it. And if you don't, you'll be part of the story wonderful. too. I would, I would highly recommend we, it if you find it. Initially, we did make a, a relatively small run. That The initial idea was to showcased them at Inter Tabak. Um, I've had the pleasure of tasting the last one in November, yeah. right? This Lancero. Yeah, yeah so I about. had the, you know, no band. The best thing you can get is the stuff under the table. Right, right, right. Uh, Jeremy gave me about four or five. Yeah. Something like that and said, please sit on these for six months before you try them. They were rolled yesterday. Wow. Um, so I did. I actually... You know, and why were we patience. sitting on them for six months? We just need to let everything come together and, yeah. and just kind of marry and just We, we sit all there. know the actual real object of this game is to deliver some aged cigars somewhat. When we say aged cigars in the right. old days, two years before you'd sell. Oh, yeah. Easily two years, and, if and not more. We're trying to, for these blends, I'm trying to pitch it at least six months. Um, it's hard. But uh, yeah. I want to do it. Two, I'd love to do two years. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there you go. Good. I'm trying to get the best out of it. Well... As you're developing, obviously, accessories and cigars, there's some sacrifices that you have to make in order to deliver this high-quality product. What are some of the key sacrifices that you've come along with during this process and said, you know what, I just have to go this way, even if it financially hurts me or even if it slows down the process? Well, as um, my dear wife said to me, she's with Saatchi and Saatchi, marketing, luxury products. She says it's product development, Jeremy. So of course it's expense. You make, um, uh, you, you, you do a sort of limited runs of stuff. It doesn't work out, needs improvement. Nils and I with that bloody humidor, uh, we're on, I think we're on the number like five alteration. And then I spotted around the keyhole. You know, Nils, it's not good enough. I love it. You guys are gonna really We're going to need to put a double-headed uh, goose, which uh, adorns the walls. That's got to be around the keyhole. You put the key in its belly. I mean, the key itself is a development. Made it a brass, wow. you'll see the Colossus uh, sitting in the middle. Every detail is touched. Down it has to the be. keyhole, down to the key, it, it, down it, to it, the fine People are details. paying this price, you know. Yeah. Um, we have to What is the price the point of that humor? Um, depending upon the size, but they start from $4,000, which I'm assure you is actually very good when you see it because the craftsmanship that's going into this yeah. is very highly detailed this isn't just an yeah. average humidor i always but tell people, a, yeah exactly exactly a, a humidor is an investment into art yeah and it's something to be displayed so the more you invest into it the better off you're going to be with the details and the luxury and the and the see what's coming up next year yes <laughs> So you have more in, in the hopper coming. Well, Niels has got a dream, um, and he said to me, Jeremy, I want to make a humidor of your palace. Wow. Because it has a beautiful, as the sun hits it, it can actually go to, uh, yeah, that would be the got outside. a little photo here. Yeah, that's it. Um, it kind of is like a pink look to it, sure. a pale pink. Um, but depending upon the lighting, it kind of changes. So it's going to be a beautiful project that's going to be a very limited edition um but you know it really is you know i'm a i'm a, I'm a, I'm a cigar creator as far as a brand owner i get involved with some of the blending yep. um but uh you know what do we want to do is I, every time i see somebody one of our cigars like any brand manager you're, you're actually proud of that and so the accessories around it we're not here to make a lot of money on that. I'm not a humidor manufacturer. That's not what it's about. But I want people to have our cigars in one of the best things. So it is not just for me and my narcissism <laughs> making something great. Uh, we really want to deliver something to the client. Right. And, and I'm sure everybody here around here is the same. That's what I love about this business, really. Because I think we are determined. We put, you know, unlike maybe, uh, well, you could say maybe car, but unlike maybe beautiful things, 
we put our everybody here. Right. We make a cigar. We're putting it, it on the line. It takes a lot of you time understand? and effort into this. Yeah. Heck yeah. Totally. You know? It is extremely daunting. And with those yeah. types of just pressures and making sure that you're doing everything, you also have to deliver your values through the products that you bring. Totally. So totally. what are the core values that you're bringing through your products? Obviously, I'm already seeing a theme of quality. But well, what oh, yes. goes beyond that quality that you're bringing? You're also sharing some of your history. Well, absolutely. I mean, okay. I mean, we have our tagline is luxury, elegance, and tradition. Easy to say, but what do we do with it? Now, just here we are today smoking Lancero. One of the things that I really wanted to bring back were these sorts of old type cigars. You know, it's people look at Lanceros and say, ah, it's not our format or whatever. But this is what people used to smoke, this is the tradition. Right. When I was 12 years old, at our pre boarding school Christmas party, and everyone had a cigar in those days. You delivered either a Panatella or something like this. Robusto, right? Yeah. Robusto only came into being in like the late 80s. Right. Right. So it was always a Panatella or Lancero size. Lancero's, cigar. Lonsdale, you know, this is, so this is the tradition. And with the, um, uh, also with the family history behind it, um, that's we're bringing those traditions back as well. Your website is like an encyclopedia. Of yeah, items. Sorry about that. If you want to get into no, cigars, that is, you got to fight for it. it. <laughs> I love the detail. I love the history behind it. There's so many things that you guys have been involved in. If you also want to check out Nils's work, Nils. Yes, right? Nils and Nils. Yeah. If you want to check out Nils's work, you can follow him on an Instagram. It's at Hapit. How do you say it? Haptic Hapticum. Hapticum. Okay. That's H A P T I K U M. Um, He's done some great stuff. There's actually a video of him making one of the humidors and the amount of effort he puts in is amazing. And it's a continuous... Right. Jeremy loves me and hates me at the same time because I'll look at something and notice this one-off thing in the corner that nobody will ever notice. And he's like, yes, you're right, but I damn, I absolutely hate the fact that you're right about this. Right. Drives around um, the bloody bend. Yeah, um, if I've created something which, you know, my, my good friend and colleague here does not like, he will just say it in blunt terms. That's, what that's makes good. Great so you guys have a, a oh, very yeah. my wife gets it in the neck too sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good though. My wife at one point, um, we were coordinating things so much that I woke up and went to bed with Jeremy because of the time difference, which is 12 hours, which works out very well. I call him first thing in the morning and I call him last thing in the evening. So my wife was like, you're talking to him more than you're talking to right. me. And I'm like, you're waking up with him and you're going to bed with him. And, like, and Jerry By the way, I, 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 we're based in Estonia, not just next yeah. door. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. And it's absolutely funny. We're like, Vlad, we'll just have a quick chat and it turns into 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's what happens when you guys are working on passionate projects. Yeah. Vlad, I want to talk a little bit about your background because go to his... LinkedIn page, and you're going to see a laundry list of qualifications. I'm not even going to be able to get through all of them. But just to give you an idea, you have a food and beverage background. You're a certified sommelier with fine dining experience, cocktails, uh, cigar knowledge. You have certification from La Casa de, ba La Casa de Habano and Altidus USA. And last but not least, he's one of the 60 people chosen to rate and review cigars blindly for Cigar Journal Magazine. With all of that going on, what was harder, the sommelier testing and passing through that process or all the cigar stuff and all the cigar certifications combined? I would say that uh, the wine stuff was probably harder. And I don't want to say there's, uh, they just had a, a better head start. So the, the There's certification more history has in been, wine, right? Not necessarily history, just the way the, um, the ASI, which is the European version of the, the um, World Sommelier uh, Association is at this point is over 50 years old. Um, they've just had a much longer head start. And a lot of the stuff, there's a lot of theory and, and a lot of things were written about all these historic regions. Things change every year, every week. When I took my level three, my advanced, which sadly I didn't pass, but hopefully next year. One wow, of the so you didn't that pass it? I, I passed the... Is it the, common to not, not yeah, pass? Yeah, so the pass rate, so I'm going to get into percentages here. 
So for the introductory level through the Guild of Master Psalms, the average pass rate is about 85 to 90 percent for the introductory. That's a one day okay. thing. You kind of get the basics. You take taste, you know, seven to 12 sure. different wines. Just that are the start. Like the, yeah. Just the tip of the it, iceberg. Exactly. That's kind of like an intro thing. Um, certified is more for hospitality professionals. Yes, a lot of um, passionate people who have nothing to do with hospitality still do pass it, but it does involve service. It doesn't require a, a little bit of experience as well. Um, your your wine world kind of expands from these, you know, 12, 15 basic, um, you know, well-known varietals, sure. varietals like Cabernet and Merlot and Chardonnay and yeah, everything else. Yeah, you get else. the general sense of what wine exactly. is and so where it's Exactly, so it expands to from. about 35, 40 classic wines. Yep. Meaning, all right, so... Um, you know, you need to know what a Sangiovese from Tuscany tastes like. Right, you, you got to know, know the, the difference. difference. Exactly, of the you really need to kind of get into. So the now we're getting more high level stuff. So now exactly. you're at level three. What's the pass rate of level three? So, for for certified, the pass rate is about fifty or sixty percent. Okay, and so just to get certified, yes. get the pin, be able to work at a restaurant. Yes. Well, it's not 50%. you can work it without a certification. A certification is just, hey, this guy actually knows something. Right. I, well, um, if I were going to go to a restaurant, I would want the guy with the pin, right? I want the yes. guy with the pin, yeah, not the, the guy with the Master certificate Psalms on a piece of paper, job. okay? I want the real deal. So you're the real deal, but now there's more levels beyond the pin. So there's out of, one, two, and three? Yeah, so you have four levels. It's the introductory, which you don't get a pin, or you don't as far as I know. You get a piece of paper. You get the certified one, where you get the little uh, purple pin. Then you get the green one, which is advanced, a little bit bigger, too. Good. And, you know, size, size does size. matter. Yeah, size of course. Matters. We want to see that pin. Uh, and then the Master Psalm, which is extremely hard to pass. I would probably compare it to a PhD in terms yeah, of... Yeah, and that's the one that you were going uh, for? No, not not yet. One point. I'll go crazy enough that hopefully I'll get to that point at some So time. what level were you just going for? The I'm second going for one the with the that's green the pin? the third one the, for the green pin. Okay, so um, you got the purple pin. Yeah, so we the need way to it get works the green is pin. you do about 60% of the people that pass, about... 10 to 15 percent decide to apply for the advanced and only a portion of them are accepted you take an online wow. theory exam uh, and it's designed for you not to fail but it's designed so you can't get all the answers um, wow we had off the top of my head i think last year we had something like 150 questions in 45 minutes so Holy the, it's cow. very much like you either know you or you don't. Go, go, go. Uh, you can't go back to the You're questions. You're in the hot seat. Exactly. Okay, so wow. This is an drug. advanced test. One of wines. So it's basically so no. like, what's this region named this particular river, vineyard, whatever else? And you just get a blank map. So you have to know that it's, you know, a region in Germany or a region in France or, you know, so the they might name all the Napa Appalachians from north to south. Right. A lot of detailed stuff. Now, the, the documentary Psalm, is basically based on people going through this master class, right? Trying to pass this master test. Yes. I remember also in that, during that like testing and training, they were like testing and grilling these students in the actual restaurant setting. So they're, they're playing like difficult customers, like, no, I want the wine colder. And you guys know like what temperature the wine should be served at. So with that being said, when you get a customer in a restaurant that's asking for something that doesn't go with the recommendation that you've been trained on, how do you handle that? <laughs> you you make sure that the customer is happy. If they so want So even if I want my wine at negative ten and it's supposed to be served at thirty degrees Celsius Absolutely. or thirty degrees Fahrenheit. Absolutely. You give if the you customer want to mix what your they want. Don with Coca-Cola, I will do it and be happy to do it. And the Psalms don't, they don't... You're, it's about hospitality. It's, you're so not it's there to showcase it, okay, how much so you Okay, know. so it's switching it from from master, like, I know I'm the expert, you do what I say, to we'll provide whatever we can to, to Absolutely. allow you to enjoy that better. That's the way you like I to enjoy I want you to it. have a good experience, period. I'm not... That's interesting. I'm, I'm there to facilitate you having a great experience. I'm not there to showcase how much I know or don't know, and there's a lot I don't know, so it's more about, I've been educated by guests quite often, and I truly enjoyed it. You know, someone who has a villa in Tuscany has been there 20 different times. I've been four times, I know what I'm doing, but they're like, but oh they're... yeah, this particular, like I truly, oh, this producer is great, like I hang out with the winemaker and stuff like that. I don't have that luxury. How much of this though is still based on personal preference? Because we talk about that in cigars, right? Like this cigar tastes like this to me. and. To Jeremy, it might taste different. To you, Vlada, this might taste different. Is it the same thing in wine? Like, 
it might taste a little different or they might experience it a little bit differently and that's why they have a personal touch as to how they want to yes enjoy and it. no uh the, when it comes to tasting wine and cigars i mean especially when you're blind tasting them you have to take your personal preference it's not about whether i like it you judge it on your on their technical merits and it's hard because you're using an imperfect tool your palate and it doesn't matter how good of a taster you are it's still subjective you know nature versus nurture sure um so you're saying that even though you're trained to try to be agnostic of your own tendencies absolutely you you're, you're still inherent play a role. biases if you will right um you know i i i am not a huge fan of big pepper forward huge nicotine hit right off the bat but if i do get a cigar like that i will smoke it start to finish every single time and i'll rate it because at the end of the day i would hate if a customer or someone looking at the ratings looked at that and it made them not buy a cigar i would feel personally responsible for that it's my duty it's just my because job. you don't like it doesn't matter exactly you just my... need to rate it on its performance absolutely. and its flavors absolutely wonderful and, and it's, so it's very just, hard it's, it's just it's... saying yeah this is pepper ford if you like that you like that perfect or yeah this is very smooth sweet Got a very nice caramel. That's what I'm getting out of this. Great cigar. When, when so, you break it down, some things are non-negotiable. They're not subjective whether the construction is good or not. The smoke production, the... Con the okay, those are the constants yeah, that we course. need to measure. The, smoke production, construction, burnability. Absolutely. All, all of those, those things are very technical. The visual, very the visual is also something that I look at at a cigar, like how veiny is it? Um, when, when we're looking at a cigar and it's super veiny or it's not veiny, what are you thinking in your head as a trained professional? What are you thinking? Like either high priming, low priming? Are you thinking thick wrapper? I, I also thin? think a lot of it depends on the wrapper. Some la wrappers are just not pretty. <laughs> right. I mean, it this is, is what it is. Though. It's just some wrappers are just not pretty. And, and with tasting, I can't nail it every single time, but I'm pretty good. I always write a little thing what I think, what the what the composition is so you know let's say for example it's ecuadorian cabano with i won't even pretend that i nail the, the binder every time because i mean that's just yeah who i knows? think it's blind luck exactly right i typically always get the filler and for the most part always the wrapper but again if it's kind of pushing me if it's something if it's a big and wain, veiny leaf like i'll take that into account so wait a minute, during the process, you have to try to guess what's being used inside there, or are you just no, doing that just for yourself? No, it's just me being pretentious. Ah, <laughs> it's Vlada, so, it's Vlada being Vlada. <laughs> yeah, so it's his sommelier training that yeah, he's like it, uh, trying to see if he can deconstruct it. So it's not part of it. You're just no, no, there no. to give for Cigar Journal Very the simple. tasting like notes first, and the visual second, notes. First, second, third, and then obviously from the technical okay. position. Well, you're looking you at it little... like, okay, I kind of know that this might be Ecuadorian shade-grown wrapper. I also try to... Obviously, there is a little bit of inherent bias. Okay, I think I know what this could be wrapper-wise. They smell it, and once it's lit up, obviously cold draw, you, you write all those initial aromas and then see how it progresses. Um, really, the difference between, for me at least, the cigar that scores 90 versus 92 versus 94 is in its inherent complexity and balance. Okay, um, complex of notes of flavors that are coming out of that, yes. as well as how well do they play off of each yes. other so it's not just like boom pepper and that's exactly. all i can taste and it wipes out everything else exactly and it, okay it, so it, that's good that's what i like maybe is that why it's so hard to sometimes know what the heck i'm tasting out of this because i always tell people i'm like i don't know what i'm tasting but i like it i just like it well of course and this one has got uh, two two tobaccos um as in a filler which actually i'd never come across before this this one has two yeah. fillers that you've never yeah, come across and that was a peruvian uh, pinar and then there's something from dominican republic these guys hardly ever work for me with dominican republic so we kind of have we some... call it the uh caramello because i i looked at it in july last year when we put it together and it just the aromas were salted caramel and the oh so you named it like after caramel yeah. Says caramel. That's so, a fancy uh, way of saying caramel, though. Exactly. For us. Exactly. Oh, oh caramel. Car oh, Jesus. That's caramello. Yeah, I love the way you say that. That yeah, just sounds so it, elegant. Car caramello. If you're saying caramel, switch it up. It's caramello. <laughs> I love that. It makes. It's really making this taste a lot better. And it's, I absolutely it, love that. It's really <laughs> funny because it, the um, entire Daughters of the Wind range, I think, starts with this salted caramel with 
baking spices and, and it kind of develops from there and about the halfway point, even though you can still break it down into the thirds like any cigar, but about the halfway point, you just get a, the cigar makes a U-turn, a 180, and really? goes from from this more uh, on the baking side of the spice, of the spice rack, so think nutmeg, cinnamon, things like that. Yeah. It goes to this white and black pepper and it builds properly because those are aged fillers. It builds properly from the front of your palate all the way to the back and envelops it. It works really well and obviously I geek out. So if you do get something in, in these cigars that you agree or don't agree with, and you know, we say it's caramel or something else, I'm the person to blame because but I see so all those tasty notes. The Daughters of the Wind, not necessarily this blend, but the regular blend that you have out on the market, yes, yes. does a 180 halfway through. You've got my attention now because there's certain cigars that do that and they're meant to do that. And I right. think it's part of the experience and the trip that I go through with the cigar. And when it switches and it's well balanced and it's still going along with the cigar, you've just heightened my level of interest with the cigar. That's that's phenomenal. Did you guys try to do that or is it just a byproduct of what you came well, up with? Well, uh, for that original blend, it was... Um I'll let you on a little bit of information here, obviously. Yeah, we got uh, inside information here. Yeah, information, Pay yeah. Um, Don Jose uh, the, 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 is a great, he's a great agricultural engineer. He um, left Cuba um, and took asylum, uh, ended up in Costa Rica. He does not smoke cigars. He doesn't smoke cigars? No, not at all. Okay. Now, this is where Explain the interesting this. thing comes. How's so, he selling and, and well, these amazing he cigars only, making it? Well, it is only uh, two brands he's involved with. And really? uh, it's a tiny factory. Okay. So how does he and taste the cigar to know if it came out right? We do it. On this particular Daughters of the Wind, I'm there with my right-hand man. It says he pointed to the left. <laughs> my right-hand man, George, also was a Habanos, very, very big okay. Habanos man. Um, he also defected. And then he says, Jeremy, you've got this little project run by Cubans. Yep. And so what we do when I go down to, for this particular well, line of cigars, sit down. Don Jose, what have you got new? Then he, we will do a Fuma tasting. So just me and George. Sure. Okay? And so we'll have them, uh, I got some, a picture of this as well, which you can put up on the, the screen later. But we just have like made like little spliffs. Yeah, leaf. little Fuma airs. So, yeah, so we got a whole spread Taste of the new tobacco. stuff, as well as some existing stuff we're interested in. So in, in the regards Peru, we had a little line of, uh, he said, here we go, there's a spliff of, um, uh, Pina from Peru, sure. Habano from Peru, and what we all know, the Pelo de Oro from Peru. Yep. Okay, we want to have a look at the leaves as well before that's done. Let's check this out. So I, he's the he's the ingredient master. And you the, guys are and playing then, chef. And then we said we're gonna let's try this and this and this, and then he might say he's got something from his plantation in Costa Rica. He can said try this one, and then we uh, George and I will say right, um, let's make let's try these four here. Uh, Jose, you've got your master taster. Then I want to add something. And then we make different percentages of that. Sure. Let's make five. Start we, blending. We, we do it with a Toro, usually. And yep. it's the Dahman, which we'll come to that name later. And then we'll select. And actually, the selection we made was blend number five. And they're okay. all the same tobaccos, but in different percentages, sure. of course, right? And then so I you're remember... blending to the size of the cigar. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. And we smoke the whole thing through, and we do this over two to three days because we want our palates to be clean. And we wanted a big cigar so we can see, is there any change? Make our notes. And I remember Wonderful. I was still on number four when uh, George, he actually uh, suddenly said, Jeremy, stop what you're doing for. I've just started number five, and I want you to smoke it exactly with me. And that's how it develops because something's really interesting happening. Here. Wonderful. Right from the get-go. And so that you was a knew right away, right on the tip of the tongue, which none of the others had done. Yeah. And then we just did it together, and we had very little conversation. Just started smoking and smoking it. And was, I remember seeing George's eyebrows going up, and he you said, "You knew you hit a home run there." Well, because he really just smokes Cuban stuff. Wonderful. And so this said, no Cuban tobacco, and he says, "Jeremy," he told me months later, "This is all I smoke now." He loves it. He fell in love with it. So we had the other three. Usually, I vary the blends depending upon the size and the Vitola, which is normal. Sometimes changing depending upon the Vitola, like right. the Lancero. 
Think of it as a sommelier of wines would tell you. You have one, to blend if you have the same, If you have the same wine in five different shaped glasses, you're going to get different stuff. Exactly. The glass matters. Like never stand so the size of the cigar matters. And you have to does. adjust to it. Of course, it's the palate. That's how it wonderful. Hits the palate, right? Yeah. But in this case, <laughs> I said, we're going to put this with all of these four because they're all 52 gauge and above. Okay. Other than this, of course. So, so it works. And it works. If some worked in a different. I remember the. Um, uh, when we did the uh, uh, the Calico, our Pyramide, it was actually, the last fifth was unsmokable after three months. So we had to age and age and wow. age it because it was just too much. And then that fell into line. Let's give the people a little bit of background behind the name. Daughters of the Wind is a unique name. And I, I had to do some deep diving research on this, but... The Castagli Daughters of the Wind is named after your family's history in famous Egyptian horse stables. Yes. Now, the Daham, Dahman, Dahman. Dahma is a very rare breed of horse, and it's known for its strength, elegance, and refinement. Hold yes. right there. That sounds like a good cigar. Strength, elegance, and refinement. So, with that, is that was that the inspiration of one the blending process and two, giving it the Daughters of the Wind name? Um, certainly, I think when you go back to that history, um, kangaroos come from Australia. Right? Tobacco originally comes from Peru. We know this. What originally grew wild, and um, uh, horses are from the Middle East. And if you think of the four cornerstones of uh, Egyptian horses, which is one of where horses kicked off. Um, was uh, the Dahman breed. It was for race horses, fast horses. Right. So we brought the Sheikh Abayad stables from uh, Lady Blunt in 1918. And this, uh, we, this very, very rare, one of the four cornerstones, was almost dying out. And we had, we're very famous for a horse called Bint, Bint Dura. So this, we, we put her out to stud eventually, and we had four race horse winners. Um, and we helped the Dahman breed, still very rare today, to get on its feet. Now, if you look at that horse, as you can see, it's got very, sh very, very spindly legs, and it's got a solid head. Sure. Uh, this thing is, uh, I've st I'm not Are a great horseman. Are you guys still breeding the horses there? Uh, thanks to the Egyptian Revolution of 1956, we lost all of it. And the Sheikh of oh. stables now is overgrown with the sprawl of uh, Cairo. Wow, um, what a but, history uh, there. Yeah, though. I mean, if you're interested in that stuff, I mean, there's a lot of stories in this business. Oh, yeah. You, all you need to do is Google Castagli, Daughters of the Wind, Manchester, and you'll get the uh, Tons guy. Tons of history. Well, it's the main, he works, he's an Egyptian working with the World Bank, and uh, his desire is Daughters of the Wind, which sure. is a coming from a Bedou poem from the 6th century to describe Bedouin horses, the Daughters oh, wow. of the Wind, old poem. Man, so, uh, the elegance, the history, the yeah, luxury sure. there. That's I it. looked into the poem just because I wanted to know more. Um, and, and I'll... It basically comes out, the story goes, while the Bedouin were still nomadic, and please correct, correct. me if I'm wrong, they came upon an oasis and let their horses cause, right, get, yeah, uh, drink get the their water. water. Only four returned. And out of those four, you can trace all the original... That's at least how the poem goes. The original... Arabian horses, the Dachman being the most prized. So it kind of makes sense that the one we're going to put on a pedestal, right. if you will, is the most prized of the ones. And sure. the one that Castagli is the most famous yeah. for. Thank you guys both for being on Box Press. I really appreciate it. We love working with you on this project. You guys, just hands down, classy gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. An Thank absolute you. pleasure. Thank you.